August, Derleth, August, Arkham House, and the Cthulhu Mythos. This is the first, mm, the first of the month. Will be an audio recreation of the first edition of The Outsider and Others. Uh, the first glimpse uh, the public gets of H.P. Lovecraft's skill as a writer of horror. Just like beer, so I'm not going to list what's in the episode, so I just hope you enjoy today's surprise. Brought to you by bunnyslippers.com. Check out the brand new Dino Sound Slippers. Slippers make a roaring sound every couple of steps. Soft plush uppers, foam footbeds, grip slippers so that you don't fall on your ass when you're skulking around the house at 3 a.m. All right. And let's see, what else do we have? We also have, check out Dave's Corner of the Universe every last Tuesday of the month, part of our monthly Cthulhu Mythos and other weirdness episodes. Or go to his blog at davescorneroftheuniverse.wordpress.com. And yeah, I have to say, check out Dave's Corner of the Universe, all kinds of fun stuff. If you like role-playing games, he just recently made stats for Ambrose Beers, part of last month's Ambrose Beers. Ugh. last month's Ambrose Beers month. So yeah, check that out. And also help support the show by buying a shirt, uh, pgttcm.threadless.com. And we've got the cool Sathagua Latina Cha Ratfink-inspired t-shirts that I just made the other day. And the super cool Join a Cult t-shirt that has kind of a hand-drawn Cthulhu with X's over it. So it's, it's, I think you'll dig it. I think you'll dig it. Anyway, so also check out the show's merch table at pgttcm.com. I think it's uh, just labeled shop. Or by donating a few dollars to you, paypal.me slash pgttcm. Special thanks to all of our guests later this month. And check out whatever they've got going on. If you want to be on PGTTCM or Black Clock Audio due to your profession or hobbies in academics, arts, or literature pertaining to gothic horror, cosmic horror, weird fiction, or anything that we cover on the show, go to pgttcm.com slash contact and talk to me about stuff. Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story either a chapter, a novel, or a whole short story. Join us in our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, gothic horror, weird fiction, and cosmic horror. And don't forget to join us for our monthly show about the Cthulhu Mythos. What are you talking about? This month it's all about the Cthulhu Mythos. And Arkham uh, House Publications and August Derleth. Look for our podcast wherever you find your podcasts. We suggest Podbean or Apple Podcasts. And hey, if you're one of our regular listeners who's not a big Cthulhu Mythos fan, you probably know someone who talks about that Cthulhu guy all the time. And hey, tell them about this month. Or hey, if you've got friends who you want to know more about the Cthulhu Mythos, pass this month on to them. And it's going to be a lot of really good ep uh, really good uh, examples of H.P. Lovecraft. So, hey, um, we got that going on. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and Black, Audio, bleh, Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube. And we're also People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. So just Google Black Clock Audio Tales, People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, one of those two, you'll find us. All right. Check out the website, uh, edited by Daniel Spitzer, produced in Badger Strip Studios in lovely North Portland, Oregon, USA. The Whisper in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft, read by Morgan Scorpion, Part 7. Refusing to let these cloudy qualms overmaster me, I recalled noise instructions and pushed open the six-panelled, brass-latched white door on my left. The room beyond was darkened, as I had known before, and as I entered it I noticed that the queer odour was stronger there. There likewise appeared to be some faint, half-imaginary rhythm or vibration in the air. For a moment the closed blinds allowed me to see very little, but then a kind of apologetic hacking or whispering sound drew my attention to a great easy-chair in the farther, darker corner of the room. 
Within its shadowy depths I saw the white blur of a man's face and hands, and in a moment I had crossed to greet the figure who had tried to speak. Dim though the light was, I perceived that this was indeed my host. I had studied the Kodak picture repeatedly, and there could be no mistake about this firm, weather-beaten face with the cropped, grizzled beard. But as I looked again, my recognition was mixed with sadness and anxiety, for certainly his face was that of a very sick man. I felt that there must be something more than asthma behind that strained, rigid, immobile expression and unwinking glassy stare, and realized how terribly the strain of his frightful experiences must have told on him. Was it not enough to break any human being, even a younger man than this intrepid deliverer into the forbidden? The strange and sudden relief, I feared, had come too late to save him from something like a general breakdown. There was a touch of the pitiful in the limp, lifeless way his lean hands rested in his lap. He had on a loose dressing-gown, and was swathed around the head and high around the neck with a vivid yellow scarf or hood. And then I saw that he was trying to talk in the same hacking whisper with which he greeted me. It was a hard whisper to catch at first, since the grey moustache concealed all movements of the lips, and something in its timbre disturbed me greatly, but by concentrating my attention I could soon make out its purport surprisingly well. The accent was by no means a rustic one, and the language was even more polished than correspondence had led me to expect. Mr. Wilmoth, I presume? You must pardon my not rising. I am quite ill, as Mr. Noyes must have told you. But I could not resist having you come just the same. You know what I wrote in my last letter. There is so much to tell you, tomorrow when I shall feel better. I can't say how glad I am to see you in person after all our many letters. You have the file with you, of course? And the Kodak prints and records? Noise put your valise in the hall. I suppose you saw it. For tonight, I fear you'll have to wait on yourself to a great extent. Your room is upstairs, the one over this, and you'll see the bathroom door open at the head of the staircase. There's a meal spread for you in the dining room, right through this door at your right, which you can take whenever you feel like it. I'll be a better host tomorrow, but just now weakness leaves me helpless. Make yourself at home. You might take out the letters and pictures and records and put them on the table here before you go upstairs with your bag. It is here that we shall discuss them. You can see my phonograph on that corner stand. No thanks. There's nothing you can do for me. I know these spells of old. Just come back for a little quiet visiting before night, and then go to bed when you please. I'll rest right here, perhaps sleep here all night as I often do. In the morning I'll be far better able to go into the things we must go into. You realize, of course, the utterly stupendous nature of the matter before us. To us, as to only a few men on this earth, there will be opened up gulfs of time and space, and knowledge beyond anything within the conception of human science or philosophy. Do you know that Einstein is wrong, and that certain objects and forces can move with a velocity greater than that of light? With proper aid I expect to go backward and forward in time, and actually see and feel the earth of remote past and future epochs, you can't imagine the degree to which those beings have carried science. There is nothing they can't do with the mind and body of living organisms. I expect to visit other planets and even other stars and galaxies. The first trip will be to Yugoth, the nearest world fully peopled by the beings. It is a strange dark orb at the very rim of our solar system, unknown to earthly astronomers as yet. But I must have written you about this, at the proper time, you know, the beings there will direct thought counts toward us, and cause it to be discovered, or perhaps let one of their human allies give the scientists a hint. There are mighty cities on Yugoth, great tiers of terrace towers built of black stone like the specimen I tried to send you. That came from Yugoth. The sun shines there no brighter than a star, 
but the beings need no light. They have other, subtler senses, and put no windows in their great houses and temples. Light even hurts and hampers and confuses them, for it does not exist at all in the black cosmos outside time and space where they come from originally. To visit you, Goth, would drive any weak man mad. Yet I am going there. The black rivers of pitch that flow under those mysterious Cyclopean bridges. Things built by some elder race extinct and forgotten, before the beings came to you, Goth, from the ultimate voids, ought to be enough to make any man a Dante or a Poe, if he can keep saying long enough to tell what he has seen. But remember... That dark world of fungoid gardens and windowless cities isn't really terrible. It is only to us that it would seem so. Probably, this world seemed just as terrible to the beings when they first explored it in the primal age. You know they were here long before the fabulous epoch of Cthulhu was over. And remember all about sunken Rulea, when it was above the waters. They have been inside the earth, too, there are openings which human beings know nothing of, some of them in these very Vermont hills, and great worlds of unknown life down there, blue litten Kenyan, red litten Yoth, and black, lightless Nakai. It's from Nakai that frightful Sathogra came, you know, the amorphous, toad-like god-creature mentioned in the Necrotic Manuscripts and the Necronomicon and the Camorium myth-cycle preserved by the Atlantean high priest Clarkash Ton. But we will talk of all this later on. It must be four or five o'clock by this time. Better bring the stuff from your bag, take a bite, and then come back for a comfortable chat. Very slowly I turned and began to obey my host, fetching my valise, extracting and depositing the desired articles, and finally ascending to the room designated as mine. With the memory of that roadside claw-print fresh in my mind, Akeley's whispered paragraphs had affected me queerly, and the hints of familiarity with this unknown world of fungus life, forbidden you, Goth, made my flesh creep more than I cared to own. I was tremendously sorry about Akeley's illness, but had to confess that his hoarse whisper had a hateful as well as a pitiful quality. If only he wouldn't gloat so about you, Goth, and its black secrets— my room proved a very pleasant and well-furnished one, devoid alike of musty odour and disturbing sense of vibration, and after leaving my valise there, I descended again to greet Akeley and take the lunch he had set out for me. The dining-room was just beyond the study, and I saw that a kitchen L extended still farther in the same direction. On the dining-table an ample array of sandwiches, cake and cheese awaited me, and a thermos bottle beside a cup and saucer testified that hot coffee had not been forgotten. After a well-relished meal, I poured myself a liberal cup of coffee, but found that the culinary standard had suffered a lapse in this one detail. My first spoonful revealed a faintly unpleasant acrid taste, so that I did not take more. Throughout the lunch I thought of Akeley sitting silently in the great chair in the darkened next room. Once I went in to beg him to share the repast, but he whispered that he could eat nothing as yet. Later on, just before he slept, he would take some malted milk. All that he ought to have that day. After lunch, I insisted on clearing the dishes away and washing them in the kitchen sink, incidentally emptying the coffee which I had not been able to appreciate. Then, turning to the darkened study, I drew up a chair near my host's corner and prepared for such conversation as he might feel inclined to conduct. The letters, pictures and record were still on the large centre table, but for the nonce we did not have to draw upon them. Before long, I forgot even the bizarre odour and curious suggestions of vibration. I have said that there were things in some of Akeley's letters, especially the second and most voluminous one, which I would not dare to quote or even form into words on paper. This hesitancy applies with still greater force to the things I heard whispered that evening in the darkened room among the lonely hills. Of the extent of the cosmic horrors unfolded by that raucous voice, I cannot even hint. He had known hideous things before, but what he had learned since making this pact with the outside things was almost too much for sanity to bear. Even now I absolutely refuse to believe what he implied about the constitution of ultimate infinity, 
the juxtaposition of dimensions, and the frightful position of our known cosmos of space and time in the unending chain of linked cosmos atoms, which makes up the immediate supercosmos of curves, angles, and material and semi-material electronic organization. Never was a sane man more dangerously close to the arcana of basic entity. Never was an organic brain nearer to utter annihilation in the chaos that transcends form and force and symmetry. I learnt whence Cthulhu first came, and why half the great temporary stars of history had flared forth. I guessed, from hints which made even my informant pause timidly, the secret behind the Magellanic clouds and globular nebulae, and the black truth veiled by the immemorial allegory of Tao. The nature of the Doels was plainly revealed, and I was told the essence, though not the source, of the hounds of Tyndalos. The legend of Yig, father of serpents, remained figurative no longer, and I started with loathing when told of the monstrous nuclear chaos beyond angled space which the Necronomicon had mercifully cloaked under the name of Azathoth. It was shocking to have the foulest nightmares of secret myth cleared up in concrete terms whose stark, morbid hatefulness exceeded the boldest hints of ancient and medieval mystics. Ineluctably, I was led to believe that the first whispers of these accursed tales must have had discourse with Akeley's outer ones, and perhaps have visited outer cosmic realms as Akeley now proposed visiting them. I was told of the black stone and what it implied, and was glad that it had not reached me. My guesses about those hieroglyphics had been all too correct, and yet Akeley now seemed reconciled to the whole fiendish system he had stumbled upon, reconciled and eager to probe farther into the monstrous abyss. I wondered what beings he had talked with since his last letter to me, and whether many of them had been as human as that first emissary he had mentioned. The tension in my head grew insufferable, and I built up all sorts of wild theories about that queer persistent odour, and those insidious hints of vibration in the darkened room. Night was falling now, and as I recalled what Akeley had written me about those earlier nights, I shuddered to think there would be no moon. Nor did I like the way the farmhouse nestled in the lee of that colossal forested slope leading up to Dark Mountain's unvisited crest. With Akeley's permission, I lighted a small oil lamp, turned it low, and set it on a distant bookcase beside the ghostly bust of Milton. But afterwards I was sorry I had done so, for it made my host's strained, immobile face and listless hands look damnably abnormal and corpse-like. He seemed half incapable of motion, though I saw him nod stiffly once in a while. After what he had told, I could scarcely imagine what profounder secrets he was saving for the morrow, but at last it developed that his trip to Yugoth and beyond, and my own possible participation in it, was to be the next day's topic. He must have been amused by the start of horror I gave at hearing a cosmic voyage on my part proposed, for his head wobbled violently when I showed my fear. Subsequently he spoke very gently of how human beings might accomplish, and several times had accomplished, the seemingly impossible flight across the interstellar void. It seemed that complete human bodies did not indeed make the trip, but that the prodigious surgical, biological, chemical and mechanical skill of the outer ones had found a way to convey human brains without their concomitant physical structure. There was a harmless way to extract a brain, and a way to keep the organic residue alive during its absence. The bare, compact cerebral matter was then immersed in an occasionally replenished fluid within an ether-tight cylinder of a metal mined in Yugoth, certain electrodes reaching through and connecting at will with elaborate instruments capable of duplicating the three vital faculties of sight, hearing, and speech. For the winged fungus beings to carry the brain cylinders intact through space was an easy matter, then on every planet covered by their civilization, they would find plenty of adjustable faculty instruments capable of being connected with the encased brains, so that after a little fitting, these travelling intelligences could be given a full sensory and articulate life, albeit a bodiless and mechanical one, at each stage of their journeying through and beyond the space-time continuum. It was as simple as carrying a phonograph record about, and playing it wherever a phonograph of corresponding make exists. Of its success there could be no question. Akeley was not afraid. 
had it not been brilliantly accomplished again and again. For the first time one of the inert, wasted hands raised itself, and pointed stiffly to a high shelf on the farther side of the room. There in a neat row stood more than a dozen cylinders of a metal I had never seen before. Cylinders about a foot high and somewhat less in diameter, with three curious sockets set in an isosceles triangle over the front convex surface of each. One of them was linked, at two of the sockets, to a pair of singular-looking machines that stood in the background. Of their purport I did not need to be told, and I shivered as with ague. Then I saw the hand point to a much nearer corner where some intricate instruments with attached cords and plugs, several of them much like the two devices on the shelf behind the cylinders, were huddled together. There are four kinds of instruments here, Wilmarth. Four kinds. Three faculties each. Makes twelve pieces in all. You see, there are four different sorts of beings represented in those cylinders up there. Three humans. Six fungoid beings who can't navigate space corporeally. Two beings from Neptune. God, if you could see the body this type has on its own planet. And the rest entities from the central caverns of an especially interesting dark star beyond the galaxy. In the principal outpost inside Round Hill, you'll now and then find more cylinders and machines. Cylinders of extra-cosmic brains with different senses from any we know. Allies and explorers from the utmost outside. And special machines for giving them impressions and expression in the several ways suited at once to them and to the comprehension of different types of listeners. Round Hill. Like most of the beings main outposts all through the various universes, is a very cosmopolitan place. Of course, only the more common types have been lent to me for experiment. Here, take the three machines I point to and set them on the table. That tall one with the two glass lenses in front. Then the box with the vacuum tubes and sounding board. Now the one with the metal discs on top. Now for the cylinder with the label B67 pasted on it. Just stand in that Windsor chair to reach the shelf. Heavy? Never mind. Be sure of the number, B67. Don't bother that fresh, shiny cylinder joined to the two testing instruments. The one with my name on it. Set B67 on the table near where you've put the machine, and see that the dial switch on all three machines is jammed over to the extreme left. Now connect the cord of the lens machine with the upper socket on the cylinder. There. Join the tube machine to the lower left-hand socket, and the disc apparatus to the outer socket. Now move all the dial switches on the machine over to the extreme right. First the lens one, then the disc one, then the tube one. That's right. I might as well tell you that this is a human being, just like any of us. I'll give you a taste of some of the others tomorrow. To this day I do not know why I obeyed those whispers so slavishly, or whether I thought Akeley was mad or sane. After what had gone before, I ought to have been prepared for anything, but this mechanical mummery seemed so like the typical vagaries of crazed inventors and scientists that it struck a chord of doubt which even the preceding discourse had not excited. What the whisperer implied was beyond all human belief, yet were not the other things still farther beyond, and less preposterous only because of their remoteness from tangible concrete proof? As my mind reeled amidst this chaos, I became conscious of a mixed grating and whirring from all three of the machines lately linked to the cylinder. A grating and whirring which soon subsided into a virtual noiselessness. What was about to happen? Was I to hear a voice? And if so, what proof would I have that it was not some cleverly concocted radio device talked into by a concealed but closely watched speaker? Even now I am unwilling to swear just what I heard, or just what phenomenon really took place before me. But something certainly seemed to take place. To be brief and plain, the machine with the tubes and sound box began to speak, and with a point and intelligence which left no doubt that the speaker was actually present and observing us. The voice was loud, metallic, lifeless, and plainly mechanical in every detail of its production. It was incapable of inflection or expressiveness, but scraped and rattled on with deadly precision and deliberation. Mr. Wilmoth, 
it said. I hope I do not startle you. I am a human being like yourself, though my body is now resting safely under proper vitalizing treatment inside Round Hill, about a mile and a half east of here. I myself am here with you. My brain is in that cylinder, and I see, hear, and speak through these electronic vibrators. In a week I am going across the void as I have been many times before, and I expect to have the pleasure of Mr. Akeley's company. I wish I might have yours as well, for I know you by sight and reputation, and have kept close track of your correspondence with our friend. I am, of course, one of the men who have become allied with the outside beings visiting our planet. I met them first in the Himalayas and have helped them in various ways. In return they have given me experiences such as few men have ever had. Do you realize what it means when I say I have been on 37 different celestial bodies, planets, dark stars and less definable objects, including eight outside our galaxy and two outside the curved cosmos of space and time? All this has not harmed me in the least. My brain has been removed from my body by fission so adroit that it would be crude to call the operation surgery. The visiting beings have methods which make these extractions easy and almost normal, and one's body never ages when the brain is out of it. The brain, I may add, is virtually immortal with its mechanical faculties and a limited nourishment supplied by occasional changes of the preserving fluid. Altogether, I hope most heartily that you will decide to come with Mr. Akeley and me. The visitors are eager to know men of knowledge like yourself and, and to show them the great abysses that most of us have had to dream about in fanciful ignorance. It may seem strange at first to meet them, but I know you will be above minding that. I think Mr. Noyes will go along too, the man who doubtless brought you up here in his car. He has been one of us for years. I suppose you recognized his voice as one of them on the record Mr. Akeley sent you. At my violent start, the speaker paused a moment before concluding. So, Mr. Wilmarth, I will leave the matter to you, merely adding that a man with your love of strangeness and folklore ought never to miss such a chance as this. There is nothing to fear. All transitions are painless, and there is much to enjoy in a wholly mechanized state of sensation. When the electrodes are disconnected, one merely drops off into a sleep of especially vivid and fantastic dreams. And now, if you don't mind, we might adjourn our session till tomorrow. Good night. Just turn all the switches back to the left. Never mind the exact order though you might let the lens machine be last. Good night, Mr. Akeley. Treat our guest well. Ready now with those switches. That was all. I obeyed mechanically and shut off all three switches, though dazed with doubt of everything that had occurred. My head was still reeling as I heard Akeley's whispered voice telling me that I might leave all the apparatus on the table just as it was. He did not essay any comment on what had happened and indeed no comment could have conveyed much to my burdened faculties. I heard him telling me I could take the lamp to use in my room, and deduced that he wished to rest alone in the dark. It was surely time he rested, for his discourse of the afternoon and evening had been such to exhaust even a vigorous man. Still dazed, I bade my host good night, and went upstairs with the lamp, although I had an excellent pocket flashlight with me. I was glad to be out of that downstairs study with the queer odour and vague suggestions of vibration, yet could not of course escape a hideous sense of dread and peril, and cosmic abnormality as I thought of the place I was in, and the forces I was meeting. The wild lonely region, the black, mysteriously forested slope towering so close behind the house, the footprint in the road, the sick, motionless whisper in the dark, the hellish cylinders and machines and above all, the invitations to strange surgery and stranger voyagings. These things, all so new and in such sudden succession, 
rushed in on me with a cumulative force which sapped my will and almost undermined my physical strength. To discover that my guide Noise was the human celebrant in that monstrous bygone Sabbat ritual on the phonograph record was a particular shock, though I had previously sensed a dim, repellent familiarity in his voice. Another special shock came from my own attitude toward my host whenever I paused to analyze it, for as much as I had instinctively liked Akeley as revealed in his correspondence, I now found that he filled me with a distinct repulsion. His illness ought to have excited my pity, but instead it gave me a kind of shudder. He was so rigid and inert and corpse-like, and that incessant whispering was so hateful and unhuman. It occurred to me that this whispering was different from anything else of the kind I had ever heard, that, despite the curious motionless of the speaker's moustache-screened lips, it had a latent strength and carrying power remarkable for the wheezing of an asthmatic. I had been able to understand the speaker when wholly across the room, and once or twice it had seemed to me that the faint but penetrant sounds represented not so much weakness as deliberate repression, for what reason I could not guess. From the first I had felt a disturbing quality in their timbre. Now, when I tried to weigh the matter, I thought I could trace this impression to a kind of subconscious familiarity like that which had made Noy's voice so hazily ominous but when or where I had encountered the thing it hinted at was more than I could tell. One thing was certain I would not spend another night here. My scientific zeal had vanished amidst fear and loathing, and I felt nothing now but a wish to escape from this net of morbidity and unnatural revelation. I knew enough now. It must indeed be true that strange cosmic linkages do exist, but such things are surely not meant for normal human beings to meddle with. Blasphemous influences seemed to surround me and press chokingly upon my senses. Sleep, I decided, would be out of the question, so I merely extinguished the lamp and threw myself on the bed fully dressed. No doubt it was absurd, but I kept ready for some unknown emergency, gripping in my right hand the revolver I had brought along, and holding the pocket flashlight in my left. Not a sound came from below, and I could imagine how my host was sitting there with cadaverous stiffness in the dark. Somewhere I heard a clock ticking, and was vaguely grateful for the normality of the sound. It reminded me, though, of another thing about the region which disturbed me, the total absence of animal life. There were certainly no farm beasts about, and now I realized that even the accustomed night noises of wild living things were absent. Except for the sinister trickle of distant unseen waters, that stillness was anomalous, interplanetary and I wondered what star-spawned, intangible blight could be hanging over the region. I recalled from old legends that dogs and other beasts had always hated the outer ones, and thought of what those tracks in the road might mean. 8. Do not ask me how long my unexpected lapse into slumber lasted, or how much of what ensued was sheer dream. If I tell you that I awakened at a certain time, and heard and saw certain things, you will merely answer that I did not wake then, and that everything was a dream until the moment when I rushed out of the house, stumbled to the shed where I had seen the old Ford, and seized that ancient vehicle for a mad, aimless race over the haunted hills which at last landed me, after hours of jolting and winding through forest-threatened labyrinths, in a village which turned out to be Townsend. You will also, of course, discount everything else in my report, and declare that all the pictures, record sounds, cylinder and machine sounds, and kindred evidences were bits of pure deception practised on me by the missing Henry Akeley. You will even hint that he conspired with other eccentrics to carry out a silly and elaborate hoax, that he had the express shipment removed at Keene, and that he had Noyes make that terrifying wax record. It is odd, though, that Noyes has not ever yet been identified, that he was unknown at any of the villages near Akeley's place though he must have been frequently in the region. I wish I had stopped to memorise the licence number of his car, or perhaps it is better after all that I did not. For I, despite all you can say, and despite all I sometimes try to say to myself, know that loathsome outside influences must be lurking there, in the half-unknown hills, and that those influences have spies and emissaries in the world of men. To keep as far as possible from such influence, and such emissaries, is all that I ask of life in future. When my frantic story sent a sheriff's posse out to the farmhouse, 
Akeley was gone without a trace. His loose dressing gown, yellow scarf, and foot bandages lay on the study floor near his corner easy chair, and it could not be decided whether any of his other apparel had vanished with him. The dogs and livestock were indeed missing, and there were some curious bullet holes, both on the house's exterior and on some of the walls within, but beyond this nothing unusual could be detected. No cylinders or machines, none of the evidences I had brought in my valise, no queer odour or vibration sense, no footprints in the road, and none of the problematical things I glimpsed at the very last. I stayed a week in Brattleboro after my escape, making inquiries among people of every kind who had known Akeley, and the results convinced me that the matter is no figment of dream or delusion. Akeley's queer purchase of dogs and ammunition and chemicals, and the cutting of his telephone wires, are matters of record, while all who knew him, including his son in California, concede that his occasional remarks on strange studies had a certain consistency. Solid citizens believe he was mad, and unhesitatingly pronounce all reported evidences mere hoaxes, devised with insane cunning, and perhaps abetted by eccentric associates. But the lowlier country folk sustain his sentiments in every detail. He had showed some of these rustics his photographs and black stone, and had played the hideous record for them, and they all said the footprints and buzzing voice were like those described in ancestral legends. They said, too, that suspicious sights and sounds had been noticed increasingly around Akeley's house after he found the black stone, and that the place was now avoided by everybody except the mailman and other casual, tough-minded people. Dark Mountain and Round Hill were both notoriously haunted spots, and I could find no one who had ever closely explored either. Occasional disappearances of natives throughout the district's history were well attested, and these now included the semi-vagabond Walter Brown, whom Akeley's letters had mentioned. I even came upon one farmer who thought he had personally glimpsed one of the queer bodies at flood time in the swollen West River, but his tale was too confused to be really valuable. When I left Brattleboro, I resolved never to go back to Vermont, and I feel quite certain I shall keep my resolution. Those wild hills are surely the outpost of a frightful cosmic race, as I doubt all the less since reading that a new ninth planet has been glimpsed beyond Neptune just as those influences had said it would be glimpsed. Astronomers, with a hideous appropriateness they little suspect, have named this thing Pluto. I feel beyond question that it is nothing less than knighted Yugoth, and I shiver when I try to figure out the real reason why its monstrous denizens wish it to be known in this way at this especial time. I vainly try to assure myself that these demoniac creatures are not gradually leading up to some new policy hurtful to the earth and its normal inhabitants. But I have still to tell you of the ending of that terrible night in the farmhouse. As I have said, I did finally drop into a troubled doze, a doze filled with bits of dream which involved monstrous landscape glimpses. Just what awaked me, I cannot yet say, but that I did indeed awake at this given point, I feel very certain. My first confused impression was of stealthily creaking floorboards in the hall outside my door, and of a clumsy, muffled fumbling at the latch. This, however, ceased almost at once, so that my really clear impressions begin with the voices heard from the study below. There seemed to be several speakers, and I judged that they were controversially engaged. By the time I had listened a few seconds I was broad awake, for the nature of the voices was such as to make all thought of sleep ridiculous. The tones were curiously varied, and no one who had listened to that accursed phonograph record could harbour any doubts about the nature of at least two of them. Hideous though the idea was, I knew that I was under the same roof with nameless things from abysmal space, for those two voices were unmistakably the blasphemous buzzings which the outside beings used in their communication with men. The two were individually different, different in pitch, accent, and tempo, but they were both of the same damnable general kind. A third voice was indubitably that of a mechanical utterance machine connected with one of the detached brains in the cylinders. There was as little doubt about that as about the buzzings, for the loud, metallic, lifeless voice of the previous evening, with its inflectionless, expressionless scraping and rattling, and its impersonal precision and deliberation, had been utterly unforgettable. 
for a time I did not pause to question whether the intelligence behind the scraping was the identical one which had formerly talked to me. But shortly afterward, I reflected that any brain would emit vocal sounds of the same quality if linked to the same mechanical speech producer, the only possible differences being in language, rhythm, speed, and pronunciation. To complete the eldritch colloquy, there were two actually human voices, one the crude speech of an unknown and evidently rustic man, and the other the suave Bostonian tones of my erstwhile guide, Noise. As I tried to catch the words which the stoutly fashioned floor so bafflingly intercepted, I was also conscious of a great deal of stirring and scratching and shuffling in the room below, so that I could not escape the impression that it was full of living beings, many more than the few whose speech I could single out. The exact nature of this stirring is extremely hard to describe, for very few good bases of comparison exist. Objects seemed now and then to move across the room like conscious entities, the sound of their footfalls having something about it like a loose, hard-surfaced clattering, as of the contact of ill-coordinated surfaces of horn or hard rubber. It was, to use a more concrete but less accurate comparison, as if people with loose, splintery wooden shoes were shambling and rattling about on the polished board floor. Of the nature and appearance of those responsible for the sounds, I did not care to speculate. Before long I saw that it would be impossible to distinguish any connected discourse. Isolated words, including the names of Akeley and myself, now and then floated up, especially when uttered by the mechanical speech producer, but their true significance was lost for want of continuous context. Today I refuse to form any definite deductions from them and even their frightful effect on me was one of suggestion rather than of revelation, a terrible and abnormal conclave, I felt certain, was assembled below me, but for what shocking deliberations I could not tell. It was curious how this unquestioned sense of the malign and the blasphemous pervaded me, despite Akeley's assurances of the outsider's friendliness. With patient listening I began to distinguish clearly between voices, even though I could not grasp much of what any of the voices said. I seemed to catch certain typical emotions behind some of the speakers. One of the buzzing voices, for example, held an unmistakable note of authority, whilst the mechanical voice, notwithstanding its artificial loudness and regularity, seemed to be in a position of subordination and pleading. Noise tones exuded a kind of conciliatory atmosphere. The others I could make no attempt to interpret, I did not hear the familiar whisper of Akeley, but well knew that such a sound could never penetrate the solid flooring of my room. I will try to set down some of the few disjointed words and other sounds I caught, labelling the speakers of the words as best I know how. It was from the speech machine that I first picked up a few recognisable phrases. The speech machine. Brought it on myself. Sent back the letters and the record. End on it. Taken in. Seeing and hearing. Damn you. Impersonal force. After all. Fresh, shiny, cylinder. Great God. First buzzing voice. Time we stopped. Small and human. Akeley. Brain. Saying. Second buzzing voice. Lyon Alphatep, Wilmoth, Records and Letters, Chief Imposture. Noise. An unpronounceable word or name, possibly Ngar Kathun. Harmless, peace, couple of weeks, theatrical, told you before. First buzzing voice. No reason, original plan, effects. Noise can watch round hill, fresh cylinder, Noise car. Noise. Well, all yours. Down here. Rest. Place. Several voices at once in indistinguishable speech. Many footsteps, including the peculiar loose stirring or clattering. A curious sort of flapping sound. The sound of an automobile starting and receding. Silence. That is the substance of what my ears brought me as I lay rigid upon that strange upstairs bed in the haunted farmhouse among the demoniac hills. Lay there fully dressed, 
with a revolver clenched in my right hand and a pocket flashlight gripped in my left. I became, as I have said, broad awake, but a kind of obscure paralysis nevertheless kept me inert till long after the last echoes of the sounds had died away. I heard the wooden, deliberate ticking of the ancient Connecticut clock somewhere far below, and at last made out the irregular snoring of a sleeper. Akeley must have dozed off after the strange session, and I could well believe that he needed to do so. Just what to think or what to do was more than I could decide. After all, what had I heard beyond things which previous information might have led me to expect? Had I not known that the nameless outsiders were now freely admitted to the farmhouse, no doubt Akeley had been surprised by an unexpected visit from them. Yet something in that fragmentary discourse had chilled me immeasurably, raised the most grotesque and horrible doubts, and made me wish fervently that I might wake up and prove everything a dream. I think my subconscious mind must have caught something which my consciousness had not yet recognised. But what of Akeley? Was he not my friend, and would he not have protested if any harm were meant me? The peaceful snoring below seemed to cast ridicule on all my suddenly intensified fears. Was it possible that Akeley had been imposed upon and used as a lure to draw me into the hills with the letters and pictures and phonograph record? Did those beings mean to engulf us both in a common destruction, because we had come to know too much? Again I thought of the abruptness and unnaturalness of that change in the situation which must have occurred between Akeley's penultimate and final letters. Something, my instinct told me, was terribly wrong. All was not as it seemed. That acrid coffee which I refused. Had there not been an attempt by some hidden, unknown entity to drug it? I must talk to Akeley at once and restore his sense of proportion. They had hypnotized him with their promises of cosmic revelations, but now he must listen to reason. We must get out of this before it would be too late. If he lacked the willpower to make the break for liberty, I would supply it. Or if I could not persuade him to go, I could at least go myself. Surely he would let me take his Ford and leave it in a garage in Brattleboro. I had noticed it in the shed the door being left unlocked and open now that peril was deemed past, and I believed there was a good chance of its being ready for instant use. That momentary dislike of Akeley which I had felt during and after the evening's conversation was all gone now. He was in a position much like my own, and we must stick together. Knowing his indisposed condition, I hated to wake him at this juncture, but I knew that I must. I could not stay in this place till morning, as matters stood. At last I felt able to act, and stretched myself vigorously to regain command of my muscles. Arising with a caution more impulsive than deliberate, I found and donned my hat, took my valise, and started downstairs with the flashlight's aid. In my nervousness I kept the revolver clutched in my right hand, being able to take care of both valise and flashlight with my left. Why I exerted these precautions I do not really know, since I was even then on my way to awaken the only other occupant of the house. As I half tiptoed down the creaking stairs to the lower hall, I could hear the sleeper more plainly, and noticed that he must be in the room on my left, the living room I had not entered. On my right was the gaping blackness of the study in which I had heard the voices. Pushing open the unlatched door of the living room, I traced a path with the flashlight toward the source of the snoring and finally turned the beams on the sleeper's face. But in the next second I hastily turned them away and commenced a cat-like retreat to the hall, my caution this time springing from reason as well as from instinct. For the sleeper on the couch was not Akeley at all, but my quondam guide noise. Just what the real situation was I could not guess, but common sense told me that the safest thing was to find out as much as possible before arousing anybody. Regaining the hall, I silently closed and latched the living room door after me, thereby lessening the chances of awakening noise. I now cautiously entered the dark study, where I expected to find Akeley, whether asleep or awake, in the great corner chair, which was evidently his favourite resting place. As I advanced, the beams of my flashlight caught the great centre table, revealing one of the hellish cylinders with sight and hearing machines attached and with a speech machine standing close by, ready to be connected at any moment. This, I reflected, must be the encased brain I had heard talking during the frightful conference, and for a second I had a perverse impulse to attach the speech machine and see what it would say. 
it must, I thought, be conscious of my presence even now, since the sight and hearing attachments could not fail to disclose the rays of my flashlight, and the faint creaking of the floor beneath my feet. But in the end I did not dare meddle with the thing. I idly saw that it was the fresh, shiny cylinder with Akeley's name on it, which I had noticed on the shelf earlier in the evening, and which my host had told me not to bother. Looking back at that moment, I can only regret my timidity, and wish that I had boldly caused the apparatus to speak. God knows what mysteries and horrible doubts and questions of identity it might have cleared up, but then it may be merciful that I let it alone. From the table I turned my flashlight to the corner where I thought Akeley was, but found to my perplexity that the great easy chair was empty of any human occupant asleep or awake. From the seat to the floor there trailed voluminously the familiar old dressing gown, and near it on the floor lay the yellow scarf and the huge foot bandages I had thought so odd. As I hesitated, striving to conjecture where Akeley might be, and why he had so suddenly discarded his necessary sick-room garments, I observed that the queer odour and sense of vibration were no longer in the room. What had been their cause? Curiously, it occurred to me that I had noticed them only in Akeley's vicinity. They had been strongest where he sat, and wholly absent except in the room with him, or just outside the doors of that room. I paused, letting the flashlight wander about the dark study, and racking my brain for explanations of the turn affairs had taken. Would to heaven that I had quietly left the place before allowing that light to rest again on the vacant chair. As it turned out, I did not leave quietly, but with a muffled shriek which must have disturbed, though it did not quite awake, the sleeping sentinel across the hall. That shriek and noise still unbroken snore are the last sounds I ever heard in that morbidity-choked farmhouse beneath the black-wooded crest of Haunted Mountain. That focus of transcosmic horror amidst the lonely green hills and cursed muttering brooks of a spectral, rustic land. It is a wonder that I did not drop flashlight, valise, and revolver in my wild scramble, but somehow I failed to lose any of these. I actually managed to get out of that room and that house without making any further noise, to drag myself and my belongings safely into the old ford in the shed, and to set that archaic vehicle in motion towards some unknown point of safety in the black, moonless night. The ride that followed was a piece of delirium out of Poe or Rambo, or the drawings of Dore, but finally I reached Townsend. That is all. If my sanity is still unshaken, I am lucky. Sometimes I fear what the years will bring, especially since that new planet Pluto has been so curiously discovered. As I have implied, I let my flashlight return to the vacant easy chair, after its circuit of the room then noticing for the first time the presence of certain objects in the seat, made inconspicuous by the adjacent loose folds of the empty dressing-gown. These are the objects, three in number, which the investigators did not find when they came later on. As I said at the outset, there was nothing of actual visual horror about them. The trouble was in what they led one to infer. Even now I have my moments of half-doubt, Moments in which I half accept the scepticism of those who attribute my whole experience to dream and nerves and delusion. The three things were damnably clever constructions of their kind, and were furnished with ingenious metallic clamps to attach them to organic developments, of which I dare not form any conjecture. I hope, devoutly hope, that they were the waxen products of a master artist, despite what my inmost fears tell me. Great God! That whisperer in darkness with its morbid odour and vibrations. Sorcerer, emissary, changeling, outsider. That hideous repressed buzzing, and all the time in that fresh, shiny cylinder on the shelf. Poor devil. Prodigious surgical, biological, chemical, and mechanical skill. For the things in the chair, perfect to the last subtle detail of microscopic resemblance, or identity, were the face and hands of Henry Wentworth Akeley. That was the last part of The Whisperer in Darkness by H. P. Lovecraft, read by Morgan Scorpion. All sound effects courtesy of Audacity Software. Hey everyone, thank you again for listening to the show. 
we're not done. We've got more Lovecraft coming up. But just a reminder to rate, review, and subscribe if you're enjoying the show. If you have any suggestions, you can contact me on Facebook at People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos and Black Clock Audio Tales. So, yeah, if you have any suggestions, anything you want to hear on the show, you want to read something, you want to be a guest on the show... Hey, are you in Portland and want to be a guest on Welcome to Portland? Sit in the basement and uh, drink beer and eat charcuterie and uh, talk about yourself? Hey, I'm down for it. Go to pgttcm.com and check out Welcome to Portland. All right, back to the show. The Whisperer in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft Read by Morgan Scorpion Part 5 then, apparently crossing my incoherent note and reaching me Saturday afternoon, September 8th, came that curiously different and calming letter, neatly typed on a new machine, that strange letter of reassurance and invitation which must have marked so prodigious a transition in the whole nightmare drama of the Lonely Hills. Again, I will quote from memory, seeking for special reasons to preserve as much of the flavour of the style as I can. It was postmarked Bellows Falls, and the signature, as well as the body of the letter, was typed, as is frequent with beginners in typing. The text, though, was marvellously accurate for Tyro's work, and I concluded that Akeley must have used a machine at some previous period, perhaps in college. To say that the letter relieved me would be only fair, yet beneath my relief lay a substratum of uneasiness. If Akeley had been sane in his terror... Was he now sane in his deliverance? And the sort of improved rapport mentioned, what was it? The entire thing implied such a diametrical reversal of Akeley's previous attitude. But here is the substance of the text, carefully transcribed from a memory in which I take some pride. Townsend, Vermont, Thursday, September the 6th, 1928 My dear Wilmarth, it gives me great pleasure to be able to set you at rest regarding all the silly things I've been writing you. I say silly, although by that I mean my frightened attitude rather than my descriptions of certain phenomena. Those phenomena are real and important enough. My mistake had been in establishing an anomalous attitude toward them. I think I mentioned that my strange visitors were beginning to communicate with me and to attempt such communication. Last night this exchange of speech became actual. In response to certain signals I admitted to the house a messenger from those outside, a fellow human, let me hasten to say. He told me much that neither you nor I had even begun to guess, and showed clearly how totally we had misjudged and misinterpreted the purpose of the Outer Ones in maintaining their secret colony on this planet. It seems that the evil legends about what they have offered to men, and what they wish in connection with the Earth, are wholly the result of an ignorant misconception of allegorical speech. Speech, of course, moulded by cultural backgrounds and thought habits vastly different from anything we dream of. My own conjectures, I freely own, shot as widely past the mark as any of the guesses of illiterate farmers and savage Indians. What I had thought morbid and shameful and ignominious is in reality awesome and mind-expanding and even glorious, my previous estimate being merely a phase of man's eternal tendency to hate and fear and shrink from the utterly different. Now I regret the harm I have inflicted upon these alien and incredible beings in the course of our nightly skirmishes. If only I had consented to talk peacefully and reasonably with them in the first place, but they bear me no grudge, their emotions being organised very differently from ours. It is their misfortune to have had as their human agents in Vermont some very inferior specimens, the late Walter Brown, for example, he prejudiced me vastly against them. Actually, they have never knowingly harmed men, but have often been cruelly wronged and spied upon by our species. There is a whole secret cult of evil men. A man of your mystical erudition will understand me when I link them with Hastor and the Yellow Sign, devoted to the purpose of tracking them down and injuring them on behalf of monstrous powers from other dimensions. It is against these aggressors, not against normal humanity, that the drastic precautions of the outer ones are directed. Incidentally, I learnt that many of our lost letters were stolen not by the outer ones, but by the emissaries of this malign cult. 
all that the outer ones wish of man is peace and non-molestation and an increasing intellectual rapport. This latter is absolutely necessary now that our inventions and devices are expanding our knowledge and motions and making it more and more impossible for the outer ones necessary outposts to exist secretly on this planet. The alien beings desire to know mankind more fully and to have a few of mankind's philosophic and scientific leaders know more about them. With such an exchange of knowledge, all perils will pass, and a satisfactory modus vivendi be established. The very idea of any attempt to enslave or degrade mankind is ridiculous. As a beginning of this improved rapport, the Outer Ones have naturally chosen me, whose knowledge of them is already so considerable, as their primary interpreter on earth. Much was told me last night, facts of the most stupendous and vista-opening nature, and more will be subsequently communicated to me, both orally and in writing. I shall not be called upon to make any trip outside just yet, though I shall probably wish to do so later on, employing special means and transcending everything which we have hitherto been accustomed to regard as human experience. My house will be besieged no longer. Everything has reverted to normal, and the dogs will have no further occupation. In place of terror, I have been given a rich boon of knowledge and intellectual adventure which few other mortals have ever shared. The outer beings are perhaps the most marvellous organic things, in or beyond all space and time, members of a cosmos-wide race, of which all other life-forms are merely degenerate variants. They are more vegetable than animal, if these terms can be applied to the sort of matter composing them, and have a somewhat fungoid structure, though the presence of a chlorophyll-like substance and very singular nutritive system differentiate them altogether from two comophytic fungi. Indeed, the type is composed of a form of matter totally alien to our part of space, with electrons having a wholly different vibration rate. That is why the beings cannot be photographed on the ordinary camera films and plates of our known... That is why the beings cannot be photographed on the ordinary camera films and plates of our known universe, even though our eyes can see them. With proper knowledge, however, any good chemist could make a photographic emulsion which would record their images. The genus is unique in its ability to transverse the heatless and airless interstellar void in full corporeal form, and some of its variants cannot do this without mechanical aid or curious surgical transpositions. Only a few species have the ether-resisting wings characteristic of the Vermont variety. Those inhabiting certain remote peaks in the Old World were brought in other ways. Their external resemblance to animal life, and to the sort of structure we understand as material, is a matter of parallel evolution rather than of close kinship. Their brain capacity exceeds that of any other surviving life form, though the winged types of our hill country are by no means the most highly developed. Telepathy is their usual means of discourse, though we have rudimentary vocal organs which, after a slight operation, for surgery is an incredibly expert and everyday thing among them, can roughly duplicate the speech of such types of organism as still use speech. Their main immediate abode is a still undiscovered and almost lightless planet at the very edge of our solar system, beyond Neptune, and the ninth in distance from the Sun. It is, as we have inferred, the object mystically hinted at as Yugoth in certain ancient and forbidden writings, and it will soon be the scene of a strange focusing of thought upon our world in an effort to facilitate mental rapport. I would not be surprised if astronomers become sufficiently sensitive to these thought currents to discover Yugoth when the outer ones wish them to do so. But Yugoth, of course, is only the stepping stone. The main body of these beings inhabit strangely organized abysses wholly beyond the utmost reach of any human imagination. The space-time globule which we recognize as the totality of all cosmic entity is only an atom in the genuine infinity which is theirs, and as much of this infinity as any human brain can hold is eventually to be opened up to me, as it has been to not more than fifty other men since the human race has existed. You will probably call this raving at first, Wilmoth but in time you will appreciate the titanic opportunity I have stumbled upon. I want you to share as much of it as possible, and to that end must tell you thousands of things that won't go on paper. In the past I have warned you not to come to see me. Now that all is safe, I take pleasure in rescinding that warning and inviting you. 
Can't you make a trip up here before your college term opens? It would be marvellously delightful if you could. Bring along the phonograph record and all my letters to you as consultative data. We shall need them in piecing together the whole tremendous story. You might bring the Kodak prints too, since I seem to have mislaid the negatives and my own prints in all this recent excitement. But what a wealth of facts I have to add to all this groping and tentative material, and what a stupendous device I have to supplement my additions. Don't hesitate. I'm free from espionage now, and you will not meet anything unnatural or disturbing. Just come along and let my car meet you at the Brattleboro station. Prepare to stay as long as you can, and expect many an evening of discussion of things beyond all human conjecture. Don't tell anyone about it, of course. This matter must not get to the promiscuous public. The train service to Brattleboro is not bad. You can get a timetable in Boston. Take the B&M to Greenfield, and then change for the brief remainder of the way. I suggest your taking the convenient 4.10 p.m. standard from Boston. This gets into Greenfield at 7.35, and at 9.19 a train leaves there, which reaches Brattleboro at 10.01. That is weekdays. Let me know the date, and I'll have my car on hand at the station. Pardon this typed letter, but my handwriting has grown shaky of late, as you know, and I don't feel equal to long stretches of script. I got this new corona in Brattleboro yesterday. It seems to work very well. Awaiting word, and hoping to see you shortly with the phonograph record and all my letters, and the Kodak prints. I am, yours in anticipation, Henry W. Akeley. To Albert N. Wilmarth, Esquire, Miskatonic University, Arkham, Massachusetts. The complexity of my emotions upon reading, re-reading and pondering over this strange and unlooked-for letter is past adequate description. I have said that I was at once relieved and made uneasy, but this expresses only crudely the overtones of diverse and largely subconscious feelings which comprised both the relief and the uneasiness. To begin with, the thing was so antipodally at variance with the whole chain of horrors preceding it. The change of mood from stark terror to cool complacency and even exultation was so unheralded, lightning-like, and complete. I could scarcely believe that a single day could so alter the psychological perspective of one who had written that final frenzied bulletin of Wednesday, no matter what relieving disclosures that day might have brought. At certain moments, a sense of conflicting unrealities made me wonder whether this whole distantly reported drama of fantastic forces were not a kind of half-illusory dream created largely within my own mind. Then I thought of the phonograph record, and gave way to still greater bewilderment. This letter seemed so unlike anything which could have been expected. As I analysed my impression, I saw that it consisted of two distinct phases. First, granting that Akeley had been sane before and was still sane, the indicated change in the situation itself was so swift and unthinkable. And secondly, the change in Akeley's own manner, attitude and language was so vastly beyond the normal or the predictable. The man's whole personality seemed to have undergone an insidious mutation a mutation so deep that one could scarcely reconcile his two aspects with the supposition that both represented equal sanity. Word choice, spelling, all were subtly different, and with my academic sensitiveness to prose style, I could trace profound divergences in his commonest reactions and rhythm responses. Certainly, the emotional cataclysm or revelation which could produce so radical an overturn must be an extreme one indeed, yet in another way the letter seemed quite characteristic of Akeley. The same old passion for infinity, the same old scholarly inquisitiveness. I could not for a moment, or more than a moment, credit the idea of spuriousness or malign substitution. Did not the invitation, the willingness to have me test the truth of the letter in person, prove its genuineness? I did not retire Saturday night, but sat up thinking of the shadows and marvels behind the letter I had received. My mind, aching from the quick succession of monstrous conceptions it had been forced to confront during the last four months, worked upon this startling new material in a cycle of doubt and acceptance which repeated most of the steps experienced in facing the earlier wonders. Till long before dawn, a burning interest and curiosity had begun to replace the original storm of perplexity and uneasiness. Mad or sane, metamorphosed or merely relieved, the chances were that Akeley had actually encountered some stupendous change of perspective in his hazardous research, some change at once diminishing his danger, real or fancied, and opening dizzy new vistas of cosmic and superhuman knowledge. 
my own zeal for the unknown flared up to meet his and i felt myself touched by the contagion of the morbid barrier breaking to shake off the maddening and wearying limitations of time and space and natural law to be linked with the vast outside to come close to the nighted and abysmal secrets of the infinite and the ultimate surely such a thing were worth the risk of one's life soul and sanity and Akeley had said there was no longer any peril. He had invited me to visit him instead of warning me away as before. I tingled at the thought of what he might now have to tell me. There was an almost paralysing fascination in the thought of sitting in that lonely and lately beleaguered farmhouse with a man who had talked with actual emissaries from outer space, sitting there with the terrible record and the pile of letters in which Akeley had summarised his earlier conclusions. So late Sunday morning, I telegraphed Akeley that I would meet him in Brattleboro on the following Wednesday, September the 12th, if that date were convenient for him. In only one respect did I depart from his suggestions, and that concerned the choice of a train. Frankly, I did not feel like arriving in that haunted Vermont region late at night, so instead of accepting the train he chose, I telephoned the station and devised another arrangement. By rising early and taking the 8.07 a.m. standard into Boston, I could catch the 9.25 for Greenfield, arriving there at 12.22 noon. This connected exactly with a train reaching Brattleboro at 1.08 p.m., a much more comfortable hour than 10.01 for meeting Akeley and riding with him into the close-packed, secret-guarding hills. I mentioned this choice in my telegram, and was glad to learn in the reply which came toward evening that it had met with my prospective host's endorsement. His wire ran thus. Arrangement satisfactory. We'll meet 1-8 train Wednesday. Don't forget record and letters and prints. Keep destination quiet. Expect great revelations. Akeley. Receipt of this message in direct response to one sent to Akeley, and necessarily delivered to his house from the Townsend station, either by official messenger or by a restored telephone service, removed any lingering subconscious doubts I may have had about the authorship of the perplexing letter. My relief was marked. Indeed, it was greater than I could account for at the time, since all such doubts had been rather deeply buried. But I slept soundly and long that night, and was eagerly busy with preparations during the ensuing two days. 6. On Wednesday I started as agreed, taking with me a valise full of simple necessities and scientific data, including the hideous phonograph record, the Kodak prints, and the entire file of Akeley's correspondence. As requested, I had told no one where I was going, for I could see that the matter demanded utmost privacy, even allowing for its most favourable turns. The thought of actual mental contact with alien, outside entities was stupefying enough to my trained and somewhat prepared mind, and this being so, what might one think of its effect on the vast masses of uninformed laymen? I do not know whether dread or adventurous expectancy was uppermost in me as I changed trains at Boston and began the long westward run out of familiar regions into those I knew less thoroughly. Waltham, Concord, Ayer, Fitchburg, Gardner, Athol. My train reached Greenfield seven minutes late, but the northbound connecting express had been held. Transferring in haste, I felt a curious breathlessness as the cars rumbled on through the early afternoon sunlight into territories I had always read of but had never before visited. I knew I was entering an altogether older-fashioned and more primitive New England than the mechanized, urbanized coastal and southern areas where all my life had been spent. An unspoiled, ancestral New England, without the foreigners and factory smoke, billboards and concrete roads of the sections which modernity had touched. There would be odd survivals of that continuous native life whose deep roots make it the one authentic outgrowth of the landscape. The continuous native life which keeps alive strange ancient memories and fertilizes the soil for shadowy, marvelous, and seldom mentioned beliefs. Now and then I saw the blue Connecticut River gleaming in the sun, and after leaving Northfield we crossed it. Ahead loomed green and cryptical hills, and when the conductor came around I learned that I was at last in Vermont. He told me to set my watch back an hour since the northern hill country will have no dealings with new-fangled daylight time schemes. As I did so, it seemed to me that I was likewise turning the calendar back a century. The train kept close to the river, and across in New Hampshire I could see the approaching slope of steep Wontastiquet, 
about which singular old legends cluster. Then streets appeared on my left, and a green island showed in the stream on my right. People rose and filed to the door, and I followed them. The car stopped, and I alighted beneath the long train shed of the Brattleboro station. Looking over the line of waiting motors, I hesitated a moment to see which one might turn out to be the Akeley Ford, but my identity was divined before I could take the initiative. And yet it was clearly not Akeley himself who advanced to meet me with an outstretched hand and a mellowly phrased query as to whether I was indeed Mr. Albert N. Wilmarth of Arkham. This man bore no resemblance to the bearded, grizzled Akeley of the snapshot, but was a younger and more urbane person, fashionably dressed and wearing only a small, dark moustache. His cultivated voice held an odd and almost disturbing hint of vague familiarity, though I could not definitely place it in my memory. As I surveyed him, I heard him explaining that he was a friend of my prospective hosts who had come down from Townsend in his stead. Akeley, he declared, had suffered a sudden attack of some asthmatic trouble and did not feel equal to making a trip in the outdoor air. It was not serious, however, and there was to be no change in plans regarding my visit. I could not make out just how much this Mr. Noyes, as he announced himself, knew of Akeley's researches and discoveries, though it seemed to me that his casual manner stamped him as a comparative outsider. Remembering what a hermit Akeley had been, I was a trifle surprised at the ready available of such a friend, but did not let my puzzlement deter me from entering the motor to which he gestured me. It was not the small ancient car I had expected from Akeley's descriptions, but a large and immaculate specimen of recent pattern, apparently Noyes's own, and bearing Massachusetts license plates with the amusing sacred codfish device of that year. My guide, I concluded, must be a summer transient in the Townsend region. Noyes climbed into the car beside me and started it at once. I was glad that he did not overflow with conversation, for some peculiar atmospheric tensity made me feel disinclined to talk. The town seemed very attractive in the afternoon sunlight as we swept up an incline and turned to the right into the main street. It drowsed like the older New England cities which one remembered from boyhood, and something in the collocation of roofs and steeples and chimneys and brick walls formed contours touching deep vile strings of ancestral emotion. I could tell that I was at the gateway of a region half bewitched through the piling up of unbroken time accumulations, a region where old, strange things have had a chance to grow and linger, because they have never been stirred up. As we passed out of Brattleboro, my sense of constraint and foreboding increased, for a vague quality in the hill-crowded countryside with its towering, threatening, close-pressing green and granite slopes hinted at obscure secrets and immemorial survivals which might or might not be hostile to mankind. For a time our course followed a broad, shallow river which flowed down from unknown hills in the north, and I shivered when my companion told me it was the West River. It was in this stream, I recall from newspaper items, that one of the morbid crab-like beings had been seen floating after the floods. Gradually the country around us grew wilder and more deserted. Archaic covered bridges lingered fearsomely out of the past in pockets of the hills, and the half-abandoned railway track paralleling the river seemed to exhale a nebulously visible air of desolation. There were awesome sweeps of vivid valleys where great cliffs rose, New England's virgin granite showing grey and austere through the verdure that scaled the crests. There were gorges where untamed streams leaped, bearing down toward the river the unimagined secrets of a thousand pathless peaks. Branching away now and then were narrow, half-concealed roads that bore their way through solid, luxuriant masses of forest, among whose primal trees whole armies of elemental spirits might well lurk. As I saw these, I thought of how Akeley had been molested by unseen agencies on his drives along this very route, and did not wonder that such things could be. The quaint, sightly village of Newfane, reached in less than an hour, was our last link with the world which man can definitely call his own by virtue of conquest and complete occupancy. After that, we cast off all allegiance to immediate, tangible and time-touched things and entered a fantastic world of hushed unreality in which the narrow, ribbon-like road rose and fell and curved with an almost sentient and purposeful caprice amidst the tenantless green peaks and half-deserted valleys. Except for the sound of the motor, 
and the faint stir of the few lonely farms we passed at infrequent intervals, the only thing that reached my ears was the gurgling, insidious trickle of strange waters from numberless hidden fountains in the shadowy woods. The nearness and intimacy of the dwarfed, domed hills now became veritably breathtaking. Their steepness and abruptness were even greater than I had imagined from hearsay, and suggested nothing in common with the prosaic objective world we know. The dense, uninvited woods on those inaccessible slopes seemed to harbour alien and incredible things, and I felt that the very outline of the hills themselves held some strange and eon-forgotten meaning, as if they were vast hieroglyphs left by a rumoured titan race whose glories live only in rare, deep dreams. All the legends of the past, and all the stupefying imputations of Henry Akeley's letters and exhibits, welled up in my memory to heighten the atmosphere of tension and growing menace. The purpose of my visit, and the frightful abnormalities it postulated, struck at me all at once with a chill sensation that nearly overbalanced my ardour for strange delvings. My guide must have noticed my disturbed attitude, for as the road grew wilder and more irregular, and our motion slower and more jolting, his occasional pleasant comments expanded into a steadier flow of discourse. He spoke of the beauty and weirdness of the country, and revealed some acquaintance with the folklore studies of my prospective host. From his polite questions it was obvious that he knew I had come for a scientific purpose, and that I was bringing data of some importance but he gave no sign of appreciating the depth and awfulness of the knowledge which Akeley had finally reached. His manner was so cheerful, normal, and urbane, that his remarks ought to have calmed and reassured me. But, oddly enough, I felt only the more disturbed as we bumped and veered onward into the unknown wilderness of hills and woods. At times it seemed as if he were pumping me to see what I knew of the monstrous secrets of the place, and with every fresh utterance that vague, teasing, baffling familiarity in his voice increased. It was not an ordinary or healthy familiarity, despite the thoroughly wholesome and cultivated nature of the voice. I somehow linked it with forgotten nightmares, and felt that I might go mad if I recognised it. If any good excuse had existed, I think I would have turned back from my visit. As it was, I could not well do so, and it occurred to me that a cool, scientific conversation with Akeley himself after my arrival would help greatly to pull me together. Besides, there was a strangely calming element of cosmic beauty in the hypnotic landscape through which we climbed and plunged fantastically. Time had lost itself in the labyrinths behind, and around us stretched only the flowering waves of fairy and the recaptured loveliness of vanished centuries. The hoary groves, the untainted pastures edged with gay autumnal blossoms, and at vast intervals the small brown farmsteads, nestling amidst huge trees beneath vertical precipices of fragrant briar and meadow grass. Even the sunlight assumed a supernatural glamour, as if some special atmosphere or exhalation mantled the whole region. I had seen nothing like it before, save in the magic vistas that sometimes form the backgrounds of Italian primitives. Sodoma and Leonardo conceived such expanses but only in the distance, and through the vaultings of Renaissance arcades. We were now burrowing bodily through the midst of the picture, and I seemed to find in its necromancy a thing I had innately known or inherited, and for which I had always been vainly searching. Suddenly, after rounding an obtuse angle, at the top of a sharp ascent, the car came to a standstill. On my left, across a well-kept lawn which stretched to the road and flaunted a border of whitewashed stones, rose a white, two-and-a-half-story house of unusual size and elegance for the region, with a congenies of contiguous or arcade-linked barns, sheds, and a windmill behind and to the right. I recognised it at once from the snapshot I had received, and was not surprised to see the name of Henry Akeley on the galvanised iron mailbox near the road. For some distance back of the house a level stretch of marshy and sparsely wooded land extended, beyond which soared a steep, thickly forested hillside ending in a jagged leafy crest. This latter, I knew, was the summit of Dark Mountain, halfway up which we must have climbed already. Alighting from the car and taking my valise, Noyes asked me to wait while he went in and notified Akeley of my advent. He himself, he added, 
had important business elsewhere, and could not stop for more than a moment. As he briskly walked up the path to the house, I climbed out of the car myself, wishing to stretch my legs a little before settling down to a sedentary conversation. My feeling of nervousness and tension had risen to a maximum again, now that I was on the actual scene of the morbid beleaguering described so hauntingly in Akeley's letters, and I honestly dreaded the coming discussions which were to link me with such alien and forbidden worlds. Close contact with the utterly bizarre is often more terrifying than inspiring, and it did not cheer me to think that this very bit of dusty road was the place where those monstrous tracks and that fetid green ichor had been found after moonless nights of fear and death. Idly I noticed that none of Akeley's dogs seemed to be about. Had he sold them all as soon as the outer ones made peace with him? Try as I might, I could not have the same confidence in the depth and sincerity of that peace which appeared in Akeley's final and queerly different letter. After all, he was a man of much simplicity and with little worldly experience. Was there not, perhaps, some deep and sinister undercurrent beneath the surface of the new alliance? Led by my thoughts, my eyes turned downward to the powdery road surface which had held such hideous testimonies. The last few days had been dry, and tracks of all sorts cluttered the rutted, irregular highway despite the unfrequented nature of the district. With a vague curiosity I began to trace the outline of some of the heterogeneous impressions, trying meanwhile to curb the flights of macabre fancy which the place and its memories suggested. There was something menacing and uncomfortable in the funereal stillness, in the muffled, subtle trickle of distant brooks, and in the crowding green peaks and black wooded precipices that choked the narrow horizon. And then an image shot into my consciousness which made those vague menaces and flights of fancy seem mild and insignificant indeed. I have said that I was scanning the miscellaneous prints in the road with a kind of idle curiosity, but all at once that curiosity was shockingly snuffed out by a sudden and paralysing gust of active horror. For though the dust tracks were in general confused and overlapping, and unlikely to arrest any casual gaze, my restless vision had caught certain details near the spot where the path to the house joined the highway, and recognised beyond doubt or hope the frightful significance of those details. It was not for nothing, alas, that I had pored for hours over the Kodak views of the outer one's claw prints which Akeley had sent. Too well did I know the marks of those loathsome nippers, and that hint of ambiguous direction which stamped the horrors as no creatures of this planet. No chance had been left me for merciful mistake. Here, indeed, in objective form before my own eyes, and surely made not many hours ago, were at least three marks which stood out blasphemously among the surprising plethora of blurred footprints leading to and from the Akeley farmhouse. They were the hellish tracks of the living fungi from Yugoth. I pulled myself together in time to stifle a scream. After all, what more was there than I might have expected, assuming that I had really believed Akeley's letters? He had spoken of making peace with the things, why then was it strange that some of them had visited his house? But the terror was stronger than the reassurance. Could any man be expected to look unmoved for the first time upon the claw marks of animate beings from outer depths of space? Just then I saw noise emerge from the door and approach with a brisk step. I must, I reflected, keep command of myself, for the chances were that this genial friend knew nothing of Akeley's profoundest and most stupendous probings into the forbidden. Akeley, Noyes hastened to inform me, was glad and ready to see me, although his sudden attack of asthma would prevent him from being a very competent host for a day or two. These spells hit him hard when they came, and were always accompanied by a debilitating fever and general weakness. He never was good for much while they lasted, had to talk in a whisper, and was very clumsy and feeble in getting about. His feet and ankles swelled too, so that he had to bandage them like a gouty old beef-eater. Today he was in rather bad shape, so that I would have had to attend very largely to my own needs, but he was none the less eager for conversation. I would find him in the study at the left of the front hall, the room where the blinds were shut. He had to keep the sunlight out when he was ill, for his eyes were very sensitive. As noise bade me adieu, 
and rode off northward in his car, I began to walk slowly toward the house. The door had been left ajar for me, but before approaching and entering I cast a searching glance around the whole place, trying to decide what had struck me as so intangibly queer about it. The barns and sheds looked trimly prosaic enough, and I noticed Akeley's battered ford in its capricious, unguarded shelter. Then the secret of the queerness reached me. It was the total silence. Ordinarily a farm is at least modestly murmurous from its various kinds of livestock, but here all signs of life were missing. What of the hens and the dogs? The cows, of which Akeley had said he possessed several, might conceivably be out to pasture, and the dogs might possibly have been sold, but the absence of any trace of cackling or grunting was truly singular. I did not pause long on the path, but resolutely entered the open house door and closed it behind me. It had cost me a distinct psychological effort to do so, and now that I was shut inside I had a momentary longing for precipitate retreat. Not that the place was in the least sinister in visual suggestion. On the contrary, I thought the graceful late colonial hallway very tasteful and wholesome, and admired the evident breeding of the man who had furnished it. What made me wish to flee was something very attenuated and indefinable. Perhaps it was a certain odd odour which I thought I noticed, though I well knew how common musty odours are even in the best of ancient farmhouses. End of section 4 of The Whisper in Darkness by H. P. Lovecraft Read by Morgan Scorpion Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to the whole episode, and I hope you all are having a great day, a great commute, a great whatever you're doing. I hope you make your flights on time. I hope you get to your next destination. I hope you have an awesome day at work. I hope your yard work all gets done. Thank you so much for listening. Share the show with your friends. Let everyone know about it. If you like the show, give us five stars wherever you listen to and rate podcasts. Tell your friends about it. And have yourselves a wonderful day.